joining us is Dura, Duraini Baharudin, the Managing Director of uh, Value Partners uh, Asset Management Malaysia, Ifran Tarmizi, the CEO of Global uh, Sadaqah, uh, Indrawati Sobaraja, the co-founder of Pay Halal, and the Executive Director and General Counsel of Sudha Fintech, Sidiran Berhad. Um, thank you, panel, for taking the time to uh, join us uh, for this conversation very late in the afternoon. Start with uh, uh, Duraini. Um, I can't help myself. I have to make some mention. Uh, yesterday, Value Partners uh, uh, launched or listed uh, their ETF, uh, Sharia uh, 100 uh, China A shares ETF. Um, and of course, I've been looking at the prices. Uh, it's quite, <laughs> quite interesting. Uh, but this is the thing that I want to touch about uh, in this uh, session. Because as we explore uh, the opportunities and the potential of this coming finance industry, um, one question that needs to be asked is, of course, whether or not product innovation uh, come in handy uh, and become a little bit of a safety net for the industry. Uh, Duran, maybe you can share some ideas on this. Definitely. Thank you, Ibrahim Sani. Uh, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum to all. Thank you for having me on this session today. So, yeah, when it comes to product innovation, I think that is definitely uh, the function of it, right? Innovating products, be it investment products or financial uh, instruments, are all in the interest of ensuring uh, that uh, the industry will continue to evolve at a very safe or, or competitive uh, environment. For instance, uh, back in the days, we only have things that we call unit trust, that is what most uh, investors in Malaysia are familiar with. Uh, unit trust products that uh, focuses on Islamic products or ESG or even single market uh, funds. Now, how it has evolved over time is that eventually we have other products that comes in to, to supplement the availability of these products in the industry and therefore makes the landscape more competitive. Now, the question is who does that benefit? Does it benefit issuers or does it benefit uh, investors? Naturally, you will see that there will be adjustment to, to pricing fees. And who does that benefit in the end of the day? It actually benefits investors. Now, what this also does is that it's not just looking at it from a fee or revenue driving perspective, it's also driving agenda. So about 10 years ago, you probably don't hear much about Sharia compliant investments, or more than 10 years ago, you don't hear much about Sharia compliant investments in the market. In fact, uh, Malaysia is one of the most advanced market when it comes to Sharia products, be it banking products or products in the capital markets. Now, the innovation has come two ways. One, from the regulatory perspective, the regulators have provided ample um, ample regulations or, or guidelines to, to, to guide uh, issuers like ourselves. And also, it comes from the investors as well. Investors are asking for products that align more with either their faith or their principles. And this is how you see product innovation actually uh, driving uh, industry or providing a safety net to the industry because it continues to remain uh, relevant to the end investor. And we as issuers, like value partners, we have to continuously innovate and evolve to adapt to these changes. You know, talking about uh, adapting to changes, uh, a lot of technology is uh, being used. Um, in fact, uh, you know, this very conference um, is done virtually and, and before you know it, we're into the second year running. Um, where does the time fly? It's always <laughs> something that I was asked. Uh, I want to move on to uh, Indra right now because uh, one of the items that perhaps could be touched by you is, of course, technology. Um, do you think that uh, the advent of technology, the adoption of it, uh, could benefit uh, the economic recovery? Uh, we've seen how the technology adoption is uh, growing rapidly across all sectors and across all um, age groups in particular. Um, where do you think uh, the uh, uh, element of technology can help bring about further growth uh, in the financial sector? So, yeah, for for technology, uh, I believe that uh, uh, when we first came in, uh, we wanted to serve the underserved Muslim consumers. Uh, we found that there was a void in about 70% uh, of our halal global suppliers, manufacturers, retailers are on non-Muslims. Uh, and as Coupled as well with the fact that the uncertainty if you buy processed food or meat, let's say from a foreign country, like say China, all right, and uh, the halal certification could be a bit questionable. So we felt that it was our responsibility and we wanted to actually contribute in that sense, whereby transactions or purchases of goods and services would not be haram. 
So at the same time, religious conservatism was also taking hold. We saw a great shift in terms of uh, uh, employees uh, choosing to work in companies that practice Sharia management standards, uh, employees choosing EPF, uh, Islamic saving schemes. So you, it proves the rediscovery of Islam, the shift of Islam. So that's where pay halal came in, all right? And at the same time, we addressed three issues, all right? Um, so pay halal had first started as a payment gateway. Now we are generally an Islamic e-commerce payment program here. Yeah? So we addressed three main issues, which were, which is uh, riba, gara, and we make sure that the transactions are not haram, right? So let's say a consumer buys goods, all right, from cross-border. So pay halal will be able to verify the consumer goods because we have aggregated the database on 43 countries. Yeah. So, uh, for instance, we buy, let's say, a pack of Milo from Australia. We verify the goods by the brand, the format, the weight, the manufacturer, and the certification expiry date. So if you pay through pay halal, you will get what you purchase for, which is halal. And another way where we can update our halal their database is when we onboard um, merchants. So in Pay Halal, we believe our contribution would be in the Islamic payment space uh, because every fintech and bank has an Islamic instrument from uh, Islamic bank account uh, to debit cards, debit uh, and credit cards. So we saw the gap in the Islamic merchant acquiring and payment processing space. So our we have a very special uh, transaction in Akkad. It's called a Wakala by al Ujra, all right? So when the sale is done, it's done according to Islamic principles, all right? Uh, so we hold the uh, whole transactions in escrow. Right? We hold the money and when the consumer is satisfied with the goods as received, they give out a GR transaction, a goods received on our notification. So uh, this element will reduce the chargebacks, the brand risk, and generally the buyer and seller has been verified. So there's an element of transparency Basically, pay halal underwrites the entire transaction, right? And we made sure that this added surety is given to our buyers. And one way of either way we've done as well, we've also re looked at e, uh, e wallet, whereby we designed the Wakala e wallet, which is in a closed loop merchant scheme for now. Yeah? So we are in the midst of applying an e wallet license for an open loop uh, Wakala e wallet. Okay, and uh, at the same time, we also have other options opened up to us, uh, you know, uh, whereby we received uh, inquiries from the, uh, the Kingdom, the UAE, even from the US, to provide our payment technology as a payment software as a service uh, for new payment uh, systems, whereby they can check out the payment, you know. Uh, let's move on to the Islamic social finance. Um, uh, that's part of, uh, the, of the core uh, of... Uh, uh, I want to understand a little bit about how um, mm -hmm. Islamic social finance can actually be useful to bridge financing gaps and to promote sustainability uh, for the industry. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, thank you to the organizers and good afternoon to my fellow speakers and attendees. You know, I, I know to a certain extent we're talking about, you know, um, matchmaking investments in social finance. But uh, let me just address this on a uh, type of innovations that we have ourselves um, incorporated and this is just to show how we're able to capture so you know let's just take for um, Malaysia for example you know we have Malaysians who have migrated who are living abroad and these people uh, despite you know uh, their current locations they for example if they don't have access to um, any of their local credit cards or bank accounts they still want to support Malaysians especially in this current pandemic right so I've got a true story for example where a friend lives in the UK for so many years and he wants to pay zakat to one of the state bodies here. But unfortunately, he's holding a UK credit card. So he ends up paying to an NGO based there. So, you know, alhamdulillah, uh, we are able to bridge that gap for the time being because we have allowed multiple uh, international currencies. And I think this is one form of innovation that has bridged that gap from uh, global reach towards helping those on, on the ground. You know, we've got mm -hmm. access to USD, SGD transactions and, and more. And uh, we'll, we intend to increase that. And uh, one thing that's quite unique, I would say, the innovation specific to uh, our space, we, you know, have this under tap potential, which I, I know there's still an ongoing uh, discussion in regard to the whole digital assets being cryptocurrencies. You know, but we have enabled this as a form of donations since 20, uh, the year 2020. 
And you, we have seen that from this community, you know, I mean, back in those days when the, the uh, value of uh, such coins were much higher, an individual will come in, donate 0 0.15 for a Bitcoin, and he will fully fund a campaign towards a social finance cause. And can you imagine the, um, the potential of that? And that's just a, a handful that we have tapped into so far. You know, and we have you know, gone ahead and launched a campaign, for example, to build a masjid just purely on the cryptos. So I'm just emphasizing there's a lot of opportunities out there, and I'm just focusing now on the tech innovations that is bridging the gap towards uh, social finance in, in, in our space. Uh, I don't need the other aspects, but maybe I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Ibrahim. Those are, those are extremely crucial uh, that needs to be done, um, which throws me back to the first item that uh, uh, Rani was uh, talking about. Uh, sometimes uh, the market uh, might not be able to wait. Uh, there is a pent up demand for some of the products, uh, but the developers, manufacturers, people like yourselves, um, product, product uh, um, uh, makers are trying to bridge that uh, solution to the market. Uh, do you think that... Um, the pandemic is actually slowing down uh, these kind of items uh, being rolled out, or do you feel that it has little to no change, uh, Durani? Um, I think actually what's interesting about the pandemic is that, uh, back to what uh, was mentioned just now, is that uh, a lot of things are moved onto the digital platform, right? And the digital platform is actually faster than what you see in the non-digital platform or in the manual platform, which means that actually a lot of businesses are moving faster because of COVID-19. I'm not discounting that there has been victims of COVID-19, but definitely the digital platform has allowed for um, uh, COVID-19 to be a bit more manageable in terms of businesses, investments, and even transactions for that matter. Now, I think what I would like to bring back here is that, uh, for instance, what we're talking about, I mean, you mentioned just now Ibrahim Sani about our uh, ETF yesterday that was uh, listed on the Bursa Stock Exchange, and we're very honored to be here at the same time, is that what is the function of this ETF, right? At a time when savings are depleting, we're talking about for Malaysians, you talk about EPM withdrawals for ICNR and so forth, and there's very limited savings for the longer term. So how exactly can issuers like ourselves or platforms or digital platforms like those uh, by, by Global Sadaqah and also Pihalal uh, facilitate, right? For instance, with our ETF, the objective is to make investments, which is largely for your own savings, uh, accessible and cheaper. We are cutting out the middleman or i.e. the fees that is attributed to the agency which is normally a more human relationship touch and because of the digital platform we're able to convey all this information and message online digitally and how does that benefit everyone number one things are getting cheaper and you can focus your attention and your capital on things that really matter for instance your savings number two your sedekah your zakat those are very important parts of of being a human being, right? And then when we relate this all back to the core or one of the concepts of this uh, uh, session today, which is ESG, I think earlier Tansri Wahid mentioned about the, the connection between ESG and, and also Sharia. What exactly are the common traits? There's actually the, the avoidance of harm. And the avoidance of harm is not just physical harm. It's harm in every aspect, in terms of livelihood, social, in terms of governance, pollution and all of that. So this all brings it all back in because the digital age or the digital access allows for reduction in harm over um, excessive fees that has been charged in the past because we had a lot of intermediaries. And also it gives a lot of degree of uh, transparency, which Pay Halal is trying to rectify. How do we be, how are we able to identify that the sources of investments or the sources of payments or the sources of goods are in line with our faith and which also means that it's in line with the needs of the greater good of society. So I think that's where the digital platform has really uh, come in to facilitate this process. So both um, Fran and uh, Indra, yes. that digital platform is also quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the ability, yeah, the touch point is actually quite ubiquitous. People can actually, you know, move forward very quickly with you guys. Where do you think the, the growth of Islamic finance can uh, jump on the bandwagon when it comes to the technology developments out there? Um, you know, it waits for nobody, uh, but at the same time, um, you want to make sure that your products are well regulated. How do you mm -hmm. make sure that uh, the product rollout is both in tandem with what the market needs, uh, fulfills all the requir uh, requirement of, uh, regulatory requirement, 
and at the same time hits the market uh, very quickly. Yeah. Um, for me or Indra? <laughs> no, it's okay. Maybe uh, uh, sure. Indra? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, you know I, I think it's very important, regardless of whichever sector, although you know, I'm representing social finance specifically, is that we have to be at the top of our game in terms of the you know, trans transparency. Like if, if we're talking now about giving funds to someone on the ground, we need to ensure, and this is where we ensure that they are verified beneficiaries because unfortunately, there are a lot of um, you know, unfortunate sca scammers going around. So this is important, I think, from, from um, all sectors. And transparency is, is key. Like, you know, once funds have been disbursed, what happened to it? Who, who has been assisted? So these are part of puzzle, at least for what we do. And I, I just want to touch also on the point where, um, you know, uh, Mr. Durrani mentioned, um, you, you know, the whole COVID pandemic definitely has slowed down a lot of uh, various sectors across the, the globe. But for social finance, I can say for sure, at least from global sort of experience, we actually have done better than the previous years. Because, you know, I'll, I'll give a simple analogy uh, if you just give me a few seconds. You know, you and I, you know, we are now doing a lot of things digitally. We are shopping online. We're going get getting our groceries online and we get our, you know, uh, uh, supplies, milk, bread, and we're done, right? If someone were to come to you or to me and say, hey, would you like to buy more bread or milk for the, for the family? You would say, no, I've bought enough. But if someone were to come to me and you and say, hey, your neighbor needs some food. Are you willing to buy more groceries for them? And the answer is an absolute yes. So the thing is, I, I see this yeah. COVID, and as she, as she has mentioned, it has actually triggered more people to 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 uh, incorporate like social finance, social impact to everything they do, be it investments or be it on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, we have to you know really beef up our game in terms of providing the access and the um, um, the the reach, like I was saying, you know, you know, technology in terms of multiple payments. Uh, we also allow, for example, digital gold for our campaigns. We are, you know, trying to maximize our reach, and I think that's that's key for for this particular angle. Uh, Indra, do you do you agree with uh, what uh, Ifran was mentioning in terms of uh, the ability for us to pick uh, up the social element? Yeah. Uh, to me, the uh, pandemic was actually an accelerator in terms of uh, e-commerce and contactless payment. Yeah, and uh, there's something that we like to talk about. It was a digitization process of which uh, Pehalal tried to help in, in terms uh, where we saw our customers having uh, problems was whereby we created a digital AMIL mobile technology and we did likewise for Korban. If I can just emphasize a little bit of those elements, which could help and assist. So in this area, we felt that technology was really an enabler, you know, it sort of assisted the, the position that we were in. We, buy, we, uh, we created a digital AMIL uh, mobile technology that uh, allows zakat to be paid uh, via QR and social media payments. So the issuer, like say a payor, will be given a reminder. You can get a receipt also from your PPZ Maui and from Mike. So th these are little little things that uh, we felt that could assist uh, for institutions that collect like Maui and uh, PPZ. Another thing that we also got into was during the Korban season, the recent Korban season, Again, you know, with the pandemic, or, although people were free to move, but uh, there was still a lot of restraint in, in terms of uh, being in contact with other people. So we had a very, uh, this is real life uh, as well, uh, is a, we had a very uh, enterprising um, uh, a lady from uh, Kluang, Joho, uh, by the name of Cattle Queen Ranch. She has about 4,000, 5,000 cattle. So uh, we, she wanted a solution in come, upcoming Korban and what she's going to do now, you know, with this pandemic and what's going to happen to our sales. And so we created uh, for her and for others as well, a Kurban payment with digital, uh, digital Akadnya. So um, whereby it fulfills the right, you can actually select the cattle online. You can pay the money. You can make sure that you select the cattle that you want that is not in any way deformed or blind. You know, it's a, it's a good breed, yeah? You select the cattle that you want, you pay online, then you perform the Akadnya and a certification is actually issued to you. All this is done digitally. So this helped her. So we are always considering and looking into the traditional Islamic religion payment space, uh, even though we disrupt it, but we're giving people innovations and solutions, you know, fintech solutions. So at the end of the day, the cake is big and fintech is an enabler. So we want people to have these options available for them. See, yeah. And um, you we know, had our, since we started uh, Zakat, this... sure. Yeah, since we started this panel inadvertently, 
we've been talking about consumer, we've been talking about retail. Um, and of course, there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to not only the Islamic finance industry, when it comes to consumer and retail. Uh, you know, generally speaking, there's a lot of options for us to actually think about when it comes to consumers and retail. Uh, but maybe uh, we should perhaps even touch about the opportunities uh, of Islamic finance um, amongst corporates, um, governments. Uh, perhaps that will be an idea that we can also touch on in this panel. Maybe, uh, Duraini, you got some ideas on this? Um, yes, so we, I think this is a key message that was driven not just by uh, Tan Sri Wahid earlier, but also by the previous panel, right, about asset owners or cap uh, those in control of capital in directing the capital in the right direction. And this would be for both Sharia or even ESG. So what we are actually, the common, the common traits that we have here is not just the Sharia part of our um, of our topic that that is in common, it's also the benefit that it has to the greater good, right? I think that's where the ESG comes in. So I think what we have to remember is in 2000, probably about 12, 13 years ago, the ASEAN institutions, pension funds and so forth were the biggest driver of the biggest change in the bond market, which was the issuance of Sukuk. So if you recall, the, the local institutions were the big driver behind Sukuk, which led to the expansion of global Sukuk uh, indices, and which also led to global Sukuk and Sukuk being part of the important uh, allocation in any bond, uh, bond, uh, bond portfolio. So what happened there was because capital owners, asset owners actually took action and said, hey, this is the direction that we should take. So now that is the impact of actually asset owners, uh, corporates, institutions taking charge. And this is where their role now is still very pivotal. So we keep on talking about Sharia from a halal or a haram perspective. But Ibrahim Sani, I've been speaking mm. about this extensively. Sharia is not just about halal, haram. It's also about quantitative uh, standards that determines the quality of companies and why companies are important is because the companies are actually sources of returns for institutions. Companies are also the ones that's providing employment to the whole country. So that's why it's very important that these quantitative measures that these companies actually observe under Sharia standards, right, is really taken into consideration. So we should be moving away from just thinking about halal sectors or uh, excluding sin sectors and start thinking about what really does Sharia bring to the table. And I have a point on this. We were doing our ETF and Rahim Sani knows about this. We keep on stressing that the standards of Sharia testing that we adopt is the international standard. And essentially what it does, it monitors the debt and also the cash level of companies that we invest in. Now, it's just like any other normal individual. If your debt levels and your cash levels are well managed, that shows that you're a responsible individual. It translates the same to a company. And when a company manages this well, that's where the quality increases, margins can be maintained, employment can be maintained, and resources can be deployed to, to, to focusing on the part of the business that will be sustainable, for the company and also for returns in the longer term. So all of these different um, factors come into play. And I think we should start thinking that no longer Sharia is just about the halal or the haram. It really is about the quality and the quantitative uh, layers that provides like a guideline for corporates and how they operate. And this is why I think the local pension funds and even the regional pension funds have been pushing for the past 13 years. And moving forward, they should continue doing that, incorporating the bigger agenda which is ESG, which again, Tan Sri Wahid mentioned, is about the common good, about avoiding harm, right? Uh, environmental, social, and governance as well. The pandemic has really shown something that uh, is quite uh, stressful, that corporates were not ready. So even if we were Sharia compliant in our practices, or based on the quantitative measures, were we, were we, were we ready to actually tackle the pandemic and, 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 and you know, and what does it do to the society as a whole? So I think that's uh, probably yeah. what, uh, yeah. The issue is we'll probably be nev never be ready. I mean, who's ready to accept a, you know, or work under a pandemic situation? Um, who's ever ready to roll out um, some products that would be revolutionary during its time? Suku, I was, I was part of that, right, uh, in the early noughties. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a tough time trying to push forward Suku. Um, uh, product uh, across the globe. Maybe Malaysia, we're a little bit uh, familiar, but uh, imagine going to, you know, markets with poor regulatory requirements like um, Indonesia, um, like Bahrain, 
uh, <laughs> it's a tough thing to push forward, which brings about that whole notion of how do we capture the consumer or the customer size, right? Because it doesn't matter if we think about corporates or retailers uh, or consumers. Um, the, the idea here is if we focus on just the Muslim market, then okay, we have a ready-made market of whatever, one point something billion. But if the product is ubiquitous and the product can be used by everyone, and that we are not just selling on the halal haram element, but more of the QC element, that would mm -hmm. reach far greater implications. Maybe, Ifran, you can help me on this one. Uh, do you think that that kind of uh, ubiquitous kind of element would help uh, push forward for social finance? Uh, doesn't matter whether or not it's Islamic or not, just social yeah, finance yeah. Uh, at large. Absolutely. I mean, call it whatever you want. You want to call it like a Qat Hassan, you want to call it interest-free loan or something. But, you know, the bottom line is, at least I can give an example, entrepreneurs now are not able to access like conventional type of financing. I'm not saying like conventional Islamic versus like financing for their businesses. Yeah. And for, for me, there shouldn't be way. any sort of like traditional, yeah, that better term there. So the, the thing is, uh, you know, we've got um, a campaign which we just launched um, where it's a very straightforward um, uh, idea and it doesn't have to be uh, restricted to any uh, particular race, religion. It's just... We are matchmaking funds towards a Qat Hassan. Call it interest-free loan if you want. We are matchmaking these individuals to ready manufacture our products and they are using it as a capital to become an agent for this product and they will eventually you know, build up their, their income and they will repay. And once they repay the interest-free loan, it helps the next group of people and it will just continue and continue, continue. And I think no one would say that's a bad idea. I think they will agree this is actually a good idea and it, it benefits all. So I think you know connecting that to you know get, getting more support. I, I I don't foresee a lot of corporate institutions willing to go down the route of like offering court Hassan because you know there's no profit element and such. But for those who are already giving out one off like um, CSR funds or whatever funds, try to consider like th these kind of um, um, instruments where your impact could be even triple, quadruple, five times, just from the same initial amount. And uh, as you, you say, Ibrahim, these kind of things, it's, it's not specific to any particular group. It serves the, the nation and, of course, you know, the, the, the bigger globe if you expand this idea out. And uh, I mean, if yeah, you don't yeah, mind me adding to uh, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, because, um, you know, there are many uh, areas where we can g garner support for long-term multi-generational benefits. We want to call it wakaf, fine. But if I want to build a well in a rural area where they, they have to walk two kilometers to get water, nobody's going to say no to that. Everyone can benefit, even an, an ant can benefit from the water, even animals can, can, can benefit. So these kind of things, you know, we, we have to um, really expand the reach by saying, you know, this is a well, this is the sea ambulance. People on this island get medical help if they don't get this boat. To, to transport them, contribute to this boat, call it the sea ambulance. You don't have to call it wakaf or whatever you want to call it. We have like, you know, building an LPG equivalent of petrol station. This is going to sustain the income of the community. So they don't depend on hands up, uh, handouts anymore. It, you're right. Universal will, will definitely uh, bridge the gap. Uh uh, that's a very important point to add, actually, um, Ifran. Uh, but, you, you know, Indra, same question to you, but you're, you're in a, a little bit more interesting position because, you know, what, what, how ubiquitous can you get if you think about payment solutions um, uh, and, and fintech? My worry is that uh, this is, I don't know how, how blue ocean this situation is, the industry that you're operating in. And then you have big incumbents, you know, I, I don't know, MasterCard, Visa, something like that. They're also rolling out um, uh, Sharia products. Uh, do you think that, uh, you know, a, a company like PayHalal can, can actually conquer that kind of uh, space, particularly when it comes to the product services that you can roll out? It's actually quite universal. Anybody can use it. I actually wanted to say something on what uh, Irfan said, but never mind. He's already covered it, which was really great on Kanye. Yeah, so I, 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 I apologize for stealing, yeah. stealing your thoughts. But. No, no, no. It's great because I thought that uh, 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 we were working on we were we were working on a Kanye Sun crowdfunding platform for women entrepreneurs because we found a, a gap. In I mean, it's a coincidence. Yeah. 
Yep, yep. Yeah, the taxi no coincidence. Our, our, so our first ca campaign is, uh, yeah, it's a woman entrepreneur by the name of Azura. Uh, you can see it on yes. our website, and we're helping her to yeah. brilliant stuff. Brilliant. Stuff. Looking forward to seeing that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're looking okay. forward as well. Then the next to question is. All right. The next question is uh, a bit tied to what Taufik uh, uh, Iskandar was mentioning earlier. I find it very uh, interesting uh, that uh, he's putting it out there uh, as, as plain as it is. We all want to make money. Uh, we are all capitalists in nature. Um, and while we want to exhibit uh, or extol some ideas of charity and uh, think of finance maybe as one element of it, but at the end of the day, we want to earn not just for ourselves, but because we are custodians of the entities that we are running and all of this is actually profit making. How do you balance in terms of trying to capture the opportunities within Islamic finance while trying to manage that whole profit element uh, and, and not profiteering at the end of the day? Um, it's a, I don't know whether anybody or any of my panel wants to take up this question, but uh, feel free, uh, anybody, just put up your hand and we'll... Uh, pass it to you. Can, can I give an example? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Bernie. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, okay, Bernie yeah, first. Sure. Um, so yeah, balancing is very interesting, right? Uh, we, we, we talk about uh, financial returns versus uh, the more subjective returns, right? So actually, if you look at um, the Articles of Association or Memorandum of Association, most of the companies in Malaysia, their targets are mainly profit-driven. They do not talk about ESG, all these concepts, new concepts that we talk about now is does not exist. Now, what I think we need to be fair about is the fact that this is actually a constant evolution. We are now taught it in a big way because there are all these global indices that have set ESG standards. So Ibrahim, now you would know that Dow Jones, SNP, MSCI, they all have their own uh, ESG standards, right? And, and they determine what are the uh, standards that we need to observe in order to qualify. Now, but what we need to also understand is that every jurisdiction, right, has its own quirks and its own tricks. You cannot be blanketing the needs or the standards of just ESG across everyone the same way. For instance, I give you this, yeah. Indonesia, one of the biggest driver of the economy other than consumption is actually the coal sector. The coal sector drives loans, drives employment, uh, drives GDP. So you're talking about ESG standards saying, hey, this is completely unacceptable, right? So what does what then happens to the entire ecosystem that has been living off this sector? Now, is this an overnight thing? It isn't. So that's why I say everything about balancing between financial returns and also doing the right thing must also be taken into consideration with the ecosystem or the jurisdiction that you are operating within. As universal or as flat as the world is getting right now, it is not as simple. I've also spoken quickly about this some time back on what China recently is doing. The biggest news uh, for the Shigin global markets is uh, regulatory activism. So one of the biggest sectors that was hit in China was actually the after-school tutoring segment. So you imagine your, you have day school and in the evening you go for tuition classes. So this is a very big sector driving a lot of revenue. But of late, recently over the weekend, the government has banned that sector. Why? Because what that sector has essentially done by overcharging the, the services is that it has increased the disparity between the poor and the rich. They have stopped or reduced accessibility to educational support to the poor. So then the government comes in to interject. But what does that do? That takes away profit-making um, capabilities, right, for that sector. So now this is also where the government plays a role, government institutions regulation. This is not a one solution fit all and then you have a target to meet and then you hit that target and you move on it actually will evolve 30 years ago in malaysia you don't hear about you you get really excited about cpo that's when the cpo sector is developing we were also one of the biggest uh cpo producers in the world right and 30 years later we're talking about observing rspo standards in order to be high quality CPO producing companies. So these things, like I said, is, 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 it's a balancing act. And we as uh, asset managers, like value partners, uh, investors like our institutions and also companies must also know what are the limits. And the key document 
that, that regulates this or guides this for a company is actually the Memorandum of Association and Article of Association. And that is the core document that we need to go back to. And of course, Ibrahim, and uh, I would not dispute that the institutions who are the big investors in these segments, they must also be able to educate or to advise on how to draw the line between profit targets or financial targets and also social ESG uh, targets, which are a bit more subjective in nature. Uh, yeah, Ifran, you wanted to add just now? Yeah, I was just going to share like some examples where there's um, a coupling of returns and that a social finance element. So it, it just goes to say that people do want a balance of that at times. I, I know there's some pure like, you know, I just want to invest and that's it. I just want to donate and that's it. So I'll give an example where this happened recently. So th there was uh, a development of a uh, community driven token from the crypto community. And I'm not going to go into detail. I don't too much about this, but what I understand there is an element of rewards for the holder. And there's another element that provides donation and Alhamdulillah that went to a one of campaigns on, on, on Global Suraka. And the thing is, a lot of people came in worldwide because it's, it's something that combined both elements, which is something that you were mentioning also. And um, although I, I, I'm more representing Global Suraka today, if you are aware, I'm, I'm, you know, we're part of a bigger group where there are investment platforms also. And it's always been part of the group um, DNA, like you know, our, um, our various and other parts of the world where you know, even though there is some profit element to the investments, there's always a social impact element in that actual uh, uh, issuance, for example, you know, be it a, a P2P uh, issuance providing social social housing in Indonesia. And um, I do have something that is more of a preview or something that we are working on, but I, I'm not going to reveal too much, but it's pretty much tying up investments towards underdeveloped, be it government or, or worker plan. And I think that's something that would attract people when you have some element of returns, but there's also a bigger social impact. So I, I agree, we don't have to always se separate it all the time. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I think I have to uh, uh, still keep on uh, Ifran because um, there are two questions. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think both are quite, quite pointedly directed to you, actually. First is, of course, okay. how would you encourage a uh, funder to fund Kart Hassan, given no profit uh, is involved, what would be some of the biggest challenge to roll out uh, this uh, in in scale? Understood. Okay, so I, I just want to address that who we are actually um, reaching out to. There are a lot of people out there, corporates, individuals, who are giving out one-off donations anyway, be it to, to feed the poor, be it to... Uh, you know, whichever campaign, build something. So I'm reaching out to the same audience, be it the, the corporates, and I'm just telling them, you have already set your budget for this year, whatever, CSR funds, to give up for a one-off donation to help someone. And if you give out one-off donation, that's just going to be the end of it. But consider, for this particular same set of funds that you intended to give out anyway, without expecting anything in return, channel it towards a Kot Hassan campaign, uh, or for example, ours, and the Kot Hassan element will happen after that. It doesn't come back to the initial because the person is going to give it away as a donation anyway. But we are saying that this will maximize your impact from an initial 10,000 ringgit that you intended to give. It will be a one-off and that's it. The person consume, consume it, done. But if we give it and we tell them this, this amount, you know, when you return it, it's going to pay it forward to the next group of entrepreneurs. And we, of course, with some set conditions and such, uh, being caught Hassan, a bit riskier. So th this, this is one, uh, 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 I hope it answers your question because we're not... We're not targeting a whole different audience. It's just the same audience who are already giving, but I say, hey, why don't you consider giving to this instead? And of course, you know, the, the biggest challenge, you know, we are dealing with uh, humans and humans being humans. Let's all, we all come from the finance industry. I was there you know, once, even when there was a whole, uh, you know, carrot and more of a stick element, people do default for various reasons. And, you know, if you're going to tell them it's caught Hassan from the beginning, you know, they're, they're, if you know the nature, there's no, you know, late penalty, there's no uh, interest, there's no compounding and such. Th that is that challenge that people won't repay. But we are trying to explore and see whether humans will also um, surprise us and will not resort to that because they, they feel like a, a bigger um, responsibility of helping others when they repay. Of course, if they, if they have no choice, if they are really suffering, then we, we just have to wave it off. It's just the na nature of a court Hassan. And uh, was there a second question? Do you want me to read it off myself? Or... 
Uh, watch, no, uh, uh, same, I guess. Uh, how do you bridge okay. um, for you? I'll, I'll use this mm. with, uh, as is. Um, how do you bridge Wakaf and foundation when the thinking is uh, the thinking of Wakaf is still faith based? Um, the permutation to this question is um, yeah. for the for, for Dura and Indra is on uh, the products uh, sometimes have a preconceived notion of what it is yep. and how do you educate that market? Yep. That, that is the second yep. half of the question. But uh, Ifran, you can yeah. take it as is. Yeah. I, I think I, I partially addressed it earlier. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. The thing is, you know, be it a court Hassan, you can call it an interest-free microfinancing loan. The bottom line, an entrepreneur is going to get cash to, to build her business, for example. So the thing is, uh, it, it, it wouldn't matter in the end to the contributor and it wouldn't matter to the, to the, the receiver of the loan. I can tell them, like, you know, uh, excuse me, you know, this is for you to help you with the business. Uh, thank you. I don't have to say, oh, this is a court Hassan, Kof, you know, court means this in Arabic. We don't, we don't have to go to that extent. And likewise, for, for Wakaf, uh, giving that example, for example, we've built a few wells in um, you know, various parts in the rural areas where, as I mentioned, two kilometers to get water. I don't even have to call it a Wakaf. Like, I just tell them, we are building a well to provide wat water. And here's a video of the villagers who are thanking you for it. I don't think anyone would say no to that. So I think that's how we bridge it. Like, if we really want to expand our reach, like, we just tell them, like, this is serving uh, humanity, regardless of whatever religion, you're going to need water. And if we build this well, there's no restriction, only X, Y, Z can drink from this well. And I, I think that's some of the examples, and I'm sure we can be more creative with that. Like, as I mentioned, sea ambulance, you want to talk about a van or a bus. Uh, but, you know, but of course, this is where we need to change the mindset that Wakaf doesn't always have to be, like, build a masjid, build a masjid, here's my land, take it and do something with it. There's so many ways that we can expand on that idea. And I think this is the, the, the bridge, inshallah. Um, uh, maybe I added? will add Yeah, I'm going to add to that. It's quite interesting because what I see here is actually the issue, right? So when you insert languages like words like wakaf, right, it looks like it's a very religious mm -hmm. uh, concept. Mm -hmm. But that's why when mm -hmm. we talk about investment sharia compliant, Ibrahim has seen me talk about it so many times. I stress so much more on the quality of the companies that all these uh, different uh, financial ratios uh, churn out. Because essentially what we want is a universal, uh, we want it to be universally known and understood that the Sharia concept is not just a exclusive for Muslim community who understands the word Sharia and Islamic, but it goes beyond that, right? Uh, I will reiterate this again. This is something that I said just now is that we, I keep on focusing or we keep on focusing on the quantitative tests, which in our fundraising activities, we keep on educating the public on it so that they understand we are looking at good companies for you to invest in, not just halal companies, because a halal company doesn't mean it's a good company. It just means it's halal from the sector, right? And that's what I think we need to start um, doing in, instead of making Sharia concepts to be very isolated and exclusive to the Muslim 1.5 billion of us all over the world community, we should start making it a very universal uh, concept. Yeah. And that's one of the things that uh, we are quite happy with the issuance of our ETF is whilst it is called Sharia because we need to actually name it in the, in the product, but we keep on stressing on the fact that we have 100 quality stocks. Quality is what uh, Sharia uh, concepts yep. should represent. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, I just want to add um, to that, uh, that point. Sorry. No, because I want to say, although on. generally for, for the more universal approach, we, we might want to drop those terms, but we can't deny that sometimes those terms, it does appeal to a certain audience. Like, for example, you know, when you say waqf and you go to some of the our donors from Middle East, they easily just say like, okay, I want to give 100,000 to a waqf. And it, it has happened. So we, we have to have the balance, but you're right. Um, having things Sharia compliant should by default mean quality. I, I agree with you. Thank you. Um, uh, another area that I want to uh, explore uh, is on the uh, product innovation um, aspect. Um, we've seen how uh, during the pandemic, uh, product innovation, this is my personal view, uh, product innovation mm -hmm. wasn't, um, wasn't that clear. What was clear is that streamlining of solutions became quite apparent. Um, processes that were taking longer became streamlined. Um, things that could have taken th 10 steps now would take two steps. That kind of uh, improvement of efficiency across the sectors, across industries, ac across uh, you know, the way we work, all that came about 
during uh, the pandemic. Um, I, do you guys agree with this view of mine uh, in terms of the, the, the efficiency was increased during the pandemic rather than the innovation uh, aspect of it? Um, and I open this question to the floor. Um, yeah, I can take that. Actually, I disagree, Ibrahim. <laughs> I find that under stressful circumstances, when businesses are challenged, when uh, the market is uncertain, uh, you become efficient, but you also innovate. And that's also, uh, I mean, because we highlighted about our product and we actually launched an ETF, the first in the world, Sharia compliant, sorry, the first in the world ETF that invests in Sharia compliant China A companies. We did it entirely from home. So we did it efficiently and we did something completely new, first in the world. So it's very difficult for me to say, yes, there is a segregation. But of course, this goes back to corporate culture, to leadership, to maybe the agility of your organization. And that is something that I have been blessed with in leading the organization in, in, in achieving this. But yes, there is a bit of, um, I think, disruption to innovation not in terms of the product, but people are more innovating in the means of accessing consumers. So before MCO 2020, we didn't have or extensively use things like BIP, you know, and the payment on Grab was a bit different. And now it is becoming a bit more of an important mechanism or intermediary. Same goes to investments prior to MCO 2020, when you can walk into a branch and talk to your remiser, you could easily buy a stock. Then now you're doing it all via your app. So maybe innovation of product is not there, but innovation of processes is actually still ongoing. And probably that's what Indra and also Ifran can, can explain more on. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, definitely efficiency improves. But I, I think a lot of our, at least internally, our innovations definitely happen throughout the COVID period. And, and I've already mentioned some of those, like, you know, allowing people from various countries to see their own transactions in their own local currencies. That was done just, you know, uh, within this, this year or so. And that was an innovation which we, we put it like, a, you know, uh, on our platform and even the whole, you know, uh, enabling cryptocurrencies that also happened within the, the year or so. And... Um, I, I suppose, you know, maybe we had the advantage of being a bit agile in terms of, of what we wanted to switch. I mean, I, I can share an example of an idea. It's not a, a big idea, but it, it really made a difference for some. Going back to my analogy of like, you know, gro grocery shopping and such. Likewise, some sometimes people reach a stage where I've donated enough. I've already donated enough for this, uh, this well, for example. So overnight, one of the advisors just asked us, can we have a function where people can dedicate their donations to someone else? And we just said, yeah, and it was just developed overnight, like a switch of a finger, uh, like a, a, a flip. So literally the following day, people who had already said, I've donated enough myself, but now they can't say no to like, I want to donate to Ibrahim, that now you have a share in this well, which I've already had enough myself. And it came as a nice, pleasant gift. Dear Ibrahim at, at whatever gmail.com, Ifran has donated X amount to this well. And that happened o overnight for us. And uh, we are already in, in um, talks to put uh, to build a blockchain based platform so that I think that's going to be an innovation that a lot of people would appreciate we are adding more currencies so it should be more than 10 international currencies more than 44 cryptocurrencies and, uh, and we also are working towards a mobile app so um, I, I I like to say uh, maybe not so in terms at least in my own personal experience we did innovate quite a bit the, the past year or so but I'm sure maybe on the bigger picture there were some uh, restrictions as a uh, um, Durani mentioned a lot of us were working from home. So I guess we took the, op the opportunity to make it easier for people to sadaqah from home. So we, 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 we you know, uh, took, took, took that on point ourselves. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, uh, let's move on to closing statements. Uh, maybe, sure. uh, sorry, Indra, you wanted to say something? Sorry, yeah. So, so uh, just something about a short pointer. Yeah, for, for Pay Halal, in terms of our merging uh, acquiring uh, process, we made it very simple for our uh, merchants, not so much the mid tier and the top tier, but more on the uh, bottom tier. You know, our cottage and, uh, entrepreneurs, the new th those who needed a foot in. We're very inclusive. Is we don't leave those um, entrepreneurs out. So our merchant program, we made it very easy, a very three-step uh, onboarding process for them. In terms of the just to mention uh, who they are, we just needed to know uh, KYB, KYC, their product sold, business registration. So we under, uh, under uh, we underwrote the risk. We make sure that if, any, if there was a transaction cost, we just removed it. 
So we made it as, as easy as possible for them to be onboarded. Uh, because we always had this um, uh, company policy of making sure that we didn't leave anybody who wanted to get on board in e-commerce or any payment left behind. So this is one of, of which where we tried out to assist our merchants. But of course, the mid-tiers and the top tiers, like our Takafu companies, they, they, they were fine because they were already on board. So the, we, we gave them customizable dashboards, catalogs, uh, halal checkouts, uh, sales data, account reconciliations. These were very important. Uh, for them in order in times to come in future that they could actually get a bank loan with all these data that they process through the uh, Pehala, you see. So in that in that little way, we, we tried to help the, the merchants at the base scale. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, clearly, I was wrong. Okay, so the three panelists have just... <laughs> but there's, a, there's, there's, there's a, a three of them. A, a, a switch state <laughs> of thoughts. <laughs> Um, uh, let's move on to uh, closing statements. <laughs> uh, maybe we can start with uh, Ifran and then we move back to Indra and then Duraini um, uh, before we end the panel. Uh, Ifran. So, you know, the, the current situation is going to continue for quite a while. And I think it's up to us, uh, you know, anyone in, in this space to continue to make things easier for people, be it you innovate in terms of... Um, channels of uh, supporting or you come up with an investment product that also has a social finance element because that i mean i'm just speaking from my experience or what i see on the, the ground there's still a lot of people who need help so we can do it a traditional way but we're still stuck in our homes we have to incorporate technology to really support uh, this particular space and this is something that i think we are trying our little best to add more technology to make it easier you know from point A to point Z for you to help anyone around the world. And I'm just talking about just Malaysia itself. We, we, we are suffering, but there are people out there who are you know suffering even more. But I, I, I think we need to be the ones to champion this cause. So I look forward to you know any additional points from any of the panelists or any of the attendees. You've got ideas that we can work towards, that we can collaborate on. I, I'm throwing ideas if you know ways to grab the you, you want to gamify the whole concept of social finance. I'm, I'm open to that. You know, we are working towards getting a platform of blockchain. There might be other things that we're missing out that we should be focusing on first. Let, let's have that chat. Thank you. Uh, Indra? Sure. So to me, the core uh, pandemic that's just happened, it's so important that we have fair financial dealings and uh, we always improve social justice. and. Uh, Money is there to help, to assist, to bless. It's not to oppress. I always believe that and that is my philosophy. And I will see that in Islamic finance. I see that coming out from Islamic finance. And innovation and bringing forth tools from these basic principles of Islam is it's just amazing what we can do for the future. Because it, FinTech is an ocean. Islamic finance is an ocean. Uh, Islamic philanthropy market is about 2.4 trillion. So that's ample room for us to grow and, and to move and to help and to bless at the same time to also make uh, make a good living you know so uh, it's a balance to me it's always a balance it's not exploitative in any way it's not one over the other it's a balance and it's always good to give and I, that's why i truly believe in islamic finance so there's we have a lot more that we can give and we hope that more uh, you know unicorns and entrepreneurs islamic fintech entrepreneurs come out from malaysia and the country continues to nurture growth in this sector Okay. Uh, Duraini? Okay. A capital market perspective, I guess what this pandemic has shown is that actually Sharia principles are more universal than we actually thought it was. Uh, just from what Ifran and Indra has been sharing and our own experiences, uh, we no longer are talking about ESG as being a stand or ESG, which is environment, social and governance standards, being a separate um, concept than Sharia is actually closely intertwined and it's complementary of one another. And we should start actually leveraging on that that these principles for us, for Islam or Sharia principles that has existed for the past 1,400 years is actually more applicable today. It sets the standards for financial prudence. It also sets the standards for social harmony. Uh, China is probably one of the countries that's trying to balance that very well. And as uh, Muslim business owners, investors, as asset owners from Muslim-dominated regions or countries, we should start playing our part 
in educating the world about how Sharia is as is more universal has been more universal than ever. I think I'll close it at that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good way to end. Um, thanks uh, to the panel for sharing insightful conversation. Uh, there seems to be a lot, really a lot more potential uh, in the realm of Islamic finance. Uh, we now have to end this panel to uh, move on with the next session, which is to talk about the market outlook for the second half of this year.